Hello and welcome. I am the Armchair Audiophile, and today we're going to be taking a first listen to the Shure Tape. This is a really interesting IEM because they claim to have developed a proprietary low voltage electrostatic tweeter and put it into this IEM in a two driver hybrid configuration with a standard 10 millimeter dynamic taking up the rest of the frequency range. This is obviously something very new in the IEM world. I am intrigued to hear what that sounds like. So let's go ahead and get into the packaging. It comes in a lovely cylindrical box. I don't know why, but I've always liked cylindrical boxes. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense from a logistics standpoint, shipping them, but uh, it, it always makes me happy. So we're gonna go ahead and pull the top off. Oh, okay. So we've got the Shure tape, IEMs in this foam cutout in the top of the box. Just actually fit in there quite tight. Got those out. Step those in the cap. Warranty card. Oh, what is this now? Another plastic ring. Oh, that's heavy. This appears to be a carry case. And it's this slightly green, metallic, weighty metal piece. This is neat. Okay, so you unscrew it. Pretty long threads. It doesn't just come apart. There's a little bit of padding in there. Inside, you got your, your packet of goodness to eat. Spare tips. Actually, quite a few of them and the stock cable. Stock cable, the weave is extremely reminiscent of the Tin Hi-Fi P1 cable. It's not very tight. Feels good enough. The connector's are nice. Let me see if I can get that in focus. Says Shure on the connector. And soft plastic ear guides on the MMCX connector end. Now, despite this looking like a reasonably high quality cable and actually better than the P1 cable I just called it out as being similar to. I'm actually going to start today with the Tripowin C8 8 core 4.4 millimeter balanced cable. Uh, I assume that low voltage or not, tiny electrostats may require a little bit of power, and I'd like them to get the full watt per channel that the high BR5 can put out. So we're gonna go 4.4 millimeter out of the box and I will save the factory cable for low power testing in the deep dive. The shells are nicer than they look in photos. I'm not sure that they achieve the tape look that they were going for that allegedly inspired the name, but they do look cool and they do look different, but they seem to have contained all of the weirdness to the outward facing side leaving the inward side a lot softer and uh, looking like it would be more comfortable in your ear versus all the contours, points, and hard edges on the shell here. Okay, I've got the tapes on the Tripowin C8 cable. And one thing I'd like to note before I get started is that when I was plugging in the MMCX cables, they did not attach with the typical reassuring click it was a much mushier insertion than I'm used to with an MMCX cable, almost to the point that I thought I had damaged them or that they were defective. I'm actually interested to see if they work when I put them in my ears because of how unencouraging the attachment felt. However, I'm hoping that that is just a, uh, a quirk of this model and not a failure of my unit. The tapes are now in my ears and I've prepared a short playlist to get some idea of how they sound right out of the box. I'm going to start with Another Weekend by Ariel Pink because the bridge or I guess it's part of the hook of this song gets very shrill and uh, on a headphone that's hot in the treble that's going to be fatiguing and possibly downright unpleasant given that this is a sort of novel tweeter design. One of the things that I want to test right out of the gate is whether or not that tweeter is implemented well, or if we're going to get something like the first generation ceramic tweeters, which are just kind of uh, 
by and large shouty and unpleasant. Okay, we're at the part that I was concerned about, and I'll say it's like a little bit hot, but not Bayer Dynamic hot. If I listen to this on a set of DT-880s at this volume, I would be ripping the headphones off of my head. So there's a little bit of bite, but to the extent that this is my shrillness test, I'd consider it a pass. With that said, the rest of the track is really good. I don't know how I feel about vocal timbre, but this is an Ariel Pink song and that could easily be in the mix. The bass is really full, but not bloated. Soundstage, sense of depth to reverb is very good. I think I'm going to move on to the next track, though. Up next, we have our bass and percussion test with Big Crit's Catalactica. Ooh. Bass is thumping on these. Like, really thumping. I don't think they're as punchy as the periodic audio beryliums that I am also listening to. But the bass accuracy and texture is actually really nice. Spatial effects are really good. There's a really high synth panning from left to right, sort of in the upper region of this track. And I actually never really noticed that it was panning back and forth before, but it's a really pronounced imaging sensation of it moving back and forth on the tapes. I have no problem making out the hi-hats nice and accurate. They might be a little bit dry. These present really interestingly. It kind of reminds me of the first time I heard a, a single BA, single dynamic hybrid when they was really just getting started. I was listening to the KZ ZST and was just blown away by how much treble sparkle there was in addition to fullness of bass, which I was used to kind of trading between. But this obviously achieves a level of refinement that is well beyond anything I've heard from KZ. Okay, let's move on to the next track. For a soundstage test, I'm going to go ahead and listen to Parade by Delta Spirit. This whole album was recorded in a cabin, I believe, and uh, the sound of the space is really prominent throughout the recording, and I think that's an aesthetic choice that they made intentionally. So I really like to use this record to hear how much of that space I can actually perceive. Again, there's just like a little bit of hotness to the treble. I think that if you're really treble sensitive, this is a headphone that would poke that button. But as someone who enjoys a little bit of extra treble sparkle, this isn't too much of an issue for me when it's done well. When the treble peaks that you get are at least putting good refined detail in your face and not grainy, horrifying nonsense. Honestly, on what I would consider an accurate representation of this record, I'd expect to hear a little bit more depth and a little bit more warmth to the recording space, but the vocals are really good. What I am hearing is being revealed at a level of detail that I'm not really accustomed to. Dynamics are impressive. I'm getting a sense of size from these that kind of reminds me of the Odyssey iSign 20s in the sense that these sound like a larger set of transducers than are actually in my ears. Okay, I actually managed to ride all the way through that track, so we're gonna keep plowing straight through. Next up, we're gonna be doing Yo-Yo Ma and the Silk Road Ensembles, Distant Green Valley. I really like to listen to stringed instruments when I'm first breaking in a headphone to get an idea of how that sort of broad, smooth sound translates, because you're hitting a lot of the frequency range if you think about something like a cello all at once. And if there are any dips or spikes, the cello is going to sound a little bit weird. Soundstage isn't massive, but the imaging is really, really excellent. The level of information I'm getting from the sitar on this track is really something to be commended. I'm not hearing anything particularly out of place about the strings. I think I've heard them texturally sweeter, you know, on my Ether C flows. I think they're a little bit more natural. It's probably not the most natural I've heard a cello. Yeah, I think the body of the cello is getting lost somewhere in the crossover. But for things that are exclusively in the high frequency range, like the sitar, it's just, oh my fucking god. Okay, let's press on.
To round out the test, I have Com True's Future World. This is ostensibly a speed test because pretty much everything Com True's does involves really fast synths. It's also just a banger. I really like the bass and wildness on this, but more than anything, it's a treble speed test. Again, the imaging is just incredible. Damn, the way this track drops in was just a monstrous punch. All right, if I said that the treble on the 10 Hi-Fi P1 cut like a knife, the treble on the Shure tape, when you're listening to something like Com True's, cuts like a lightsaber. Like, it cuts clean and cauterizes the wound on its way through. I'm kind of speechless. These are wild. I kind of feel like Zio is hyping the Sandy Iva. Like, maybe these are just throwing hella treble in my face. But, you know, goddamn. Goddamn. Well, I can tell you one thing. In any Tin Hi-Fi P1 comparison with the Shure tape, the bass is not... The bass is not a comparison. The Shure tape is a much, much better extended headphone. I think it's bass elevated, so I wouldn't necessarily call it reference. Um, if you're going for reference, then maybe the Tin P1 with a little bit of EQ to bring the sub bass up to neutral would be a better option. But if you're just looking for something fun that also has the detail and sparkle of an alternative tweeter technology, then holy hell, these are really, really good. All right, let me pop them out of my ears and we'll have a little conversation about them. Wow. All I can say about these is wow. I am really, really, really impressed by those. And especially for, uh, I forgot to mention how much they are, $129. That's right, $129. These electrostatic tweeter, apparently amazing IEMs are $129. At that price, you can get the Trip 1C8 cable, which is $29. It's still only be at $160, bucks, which is notably $30 less than the KXXS, which is also $10 less than the 10 i5 P1. Overall, I think what I want to do with these is they're obviously going to have to have a head-to-head -head shootout with the 10 P1s. That's, that's their obvious rival. I don't know why that's so obvious, actually. They're not really related in terms of driver configurations, but I guess just to the extent that there's a planar IEM and there's a quote-unquote electrostatic IEM on the market right now, maybe they could be said to compare in terms of speed and treble detail. But the, the signatures are really completely different. So that's going to, you know, spoiler alert, that's going to be the, the, the weight of that comparison. I also want to compare these against the Odyssey iSign 20s. They really remind me of those, and I think if anything, the treble is probably tighter on these. I'm looking forward to the deep dive because I'm looking forward to spending a lot of time with these and with their super awesome green UFO looking case. So stay tuned on the channel for more impressions of the Shure tape. I'm going to be doing the Blonde BLO3 soon. I got more impressions of the LCD1 coming up. I've got a long-term update on the High BR5 coming up. Galaxy Buds. Lots of exciting things happening on the channel. So stay tuned. That's it for me, the Armchair Audio File, reminding you that life is too short for bad headphones.